Hi, everyone, and welcome to our excellent conversation about Yiddish, the four verts, 125 years and 125 more to go. We're so excited for this conversation. And as you all roll in, we're playing our latest interactive game. Yes, it's Yiddish Wordle, otherwise known as Virtual. You can play it every day on our site if you're not already. And if you have guesses as to the let, as to what today's word might be, you can throw them in the chat. We'd also love to see in the chat where you're calling in from, your relationship to the four verts, and what you're thinking you're going to miss most during Pesach. Right. What which chometz are you going to be pining for the most? Zach, it feels like you're doing very well already. No, no, but Zach, you should be doing the Kuf, Lamed, and Aleph in different places. Yeah. I'm sure the thing people want most when they're playing these games is for the whole group to help Right, them. no, I mean, no This pressure. is the highest pressure yeah. game we've ever done. I usually play. Please make sure when you're chatting to chat to everyone. Um, Arla, we welcome you from Los Angeles, but you chatted just to host and panelists. Take a look at the chat settings and make sure you go to everyone when you're putting in to the chat where you're calling in from, what chametz you'll be pining for, for Pesach, and any special relationship you have to the forward. We'd love to hear about it. And if you love Vertel as much as we do, feel free to tell us about that too. We're going to just wait a few minutes. We had quite a good turnout sign up. So we are going to just give people a minute to roll in and then we'll get started. There's always that three minute grace period. You could try links. Yeah, I could try that. Let's see. Mm. But if we end too soon, then we don't get to experience the full. Mm. Hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, well, what I do is I try letters that I didn't use before. Yeah, that's 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 Ruckel's very gentle way of saying. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't watch this. <laughs> it's, it's it's no, oh I, I it's, I've never experienced more. You know, like I really feel like Zach gets a, a medal here. for this. Like, yeah, I, I feel bad that I asked you to do this, Zach, but I know you're up to it. <laughs> No, Listen, no, it's uh, Zach is a good you, sport. This is this is like gladiator arena Vertel. I mean, you don't get better than that. You can do this. You can do it on the train. You can do it anywhere. Oh wow, well, that's a lot of odds. Uh, hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, you know what? I'm gonna kick it off. Um, I'm gonna kick it off with some intros, so we can still let people filter in. We still have people coming in, but I will start with the. A little bit of patter that's not why everyone's here, but it'll set up the whole thing. So, Zach, please continue to enjoy in the background. And I will begin with the welcome. So, welcome, everyone. I am Rachel Fishman Federson, the CEO and publisher of The Forward. And I am so thrilled to be hosting this event tonight or be kicking it off um, with Jody and Rachel and Zach, who are here to talk about a couple of things. Um, we will be talking about what Yiddish looks like today digitally. And Jody will be speaking a little bit about her trip to the Ukraine border. Um, that wasn't originally part of our program, but she just got back recently and um, you know, she, she comes, you know, straight from there to you. So we thought we wouldn't pass up this opportunity to share a little bit of Jody speaking about her original reporting. Um, but we are having this event as the sort of uh, teaser a pre kickoff for the forwards 125th anniversary, which begins on April 22nd. You will be seeing special coverage all year long. You will see events. We will have a swag store so you can purchase and proudly wear your forward paraphernalia and drink from your forward mug if you don't already have one. Um, and we are excited to be able to showcase all of the great work that the forward has done. And it also are moments like this that give us an opportunity to talk about and showcase all of the great reinvention and 
um, energized work the forward is doing today and onward for the next 125 years. Um, one special event I want to highlight to you now to put on your calendars is coming at the end of the month. Um, Jody will be hosting an, a forward editors roundtable. We will be welcoming all of the editors of the English forward, including Seth Lipsky, JJ Goldberg, and Jane Eisner for a roundtable to talk about what it's like to edit the forward. Um, we will put the link in the chat. It is going to really be very special. I cannot wait. Um, so I'm gonna quickly run through this intro of Jody, uh, our editor in chief who joined us already over two years ago from the New York Times. I have never had a couple of years go so quickly. And Jody has been reinventing our digital forward with podcasts, with newsletters, with Zoominars, uh, with amazing voices, amazing coverage, um, and her weekly newsletter every Friday. Um, and we, she's a treasure and we're thrilled to have her. And she is going to be leading the event this evening. So I'm going to hand off to Jody. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you all for joining us. I saw in the chat, Miriam Isaacs and wanted to call out, I think Rosette Wills may also be on from the Costa Foundation who are among the incredible generous supporters who help make our Yiddish report possible. Um, we want to start with me talking about Ukraine before I introduce Rachel and Zach officially. Is that what we want to do now? Yes, right? Okay, and I should just talk or you want to ask me some questions? Um, well, Jody, can you tell us a little bit about your trip? Why did you go? Who did you go with? Sure, I'd love to. And hopefully some of you have been reading. I've written quite a lot of this. Um, I'll try not to repeat everything you've already gotten in your inbox. So, you know, we, from, from the moment um, this war began and really from, from days before, we have been really focused on everything, all the different ways that this is a profoundly Jewish story from the Jewish history of the Pale of Settlement um, to the Jewish renewal that's happening, um, has been happening in Ukraine, as well as in Russia over the last decade or more to the fact that the president of course is Jewish uh, to Israel's response, to the American Jewish community's response. And, and we've published, it was way more than 100 articles a few weeks ago. So um, many, many stories and really particularly opinion pieces and personal essays about people's connections to Ukraine, either historically or today. And it's something that, um, you know, it's always difficult with a story that's um, so complicated, so big, so important, and also that's going to go on for a really long time to figure out how do we make sure to bring uh, the, the, the pieces of it that are that are most relevant and most important to our audience kind of every day and over time. It's a it's a series of sprints, really a marathon of sprints. Um, so I guess like two weeks ago, I sort of I sort of started to notice that there was there seemed to be a lot of stuff in my inbox and on my Facebook feed about rabbis and Jewish leaders going to visit the border. We had already sent um, a reporter, Larry Kohler Esses, um, who used to be on staff here and is a frequent contributor, regular contributor. He had already gone on a mission to um, a, a trip to report at the border. He was um, had gone to Romania. He spent time on the Romanian border and traveling around. And then I just started to see that all these like uh, Jewish leaders were going. I wasn't quite sure like what they were doing there or exactly why, but I thought, hey, this is something I should think about doing and think about joining. So what was actually a little bit funny about it was when I first started reaching out to colleagues and people I know about, hey, is there a trip being planned? Could I, could I tag along? That one of the first rabbis I connected with said, actually, there's a raging debate uh, about whether or not people should go um, because we all want to go. We all want to bear witness. We all want to help. But there's a concern that you know, if you don't speak the language, if you're not a doctor or a mental health professional, you're just clogging up the works. You're taking up a translator and taking up a hotel room. And it's actually gonna put more stress on the humanitarian aid system. So the next thing I did was I got our news reporter, Arno Rosenfeld to go report out that story about that debate and that tension that people were facing between whether to go or not. And then I thought, well, I should probably go and check it out myself even more so in a way because there's this debate. So I tagged along with the trip um, that was run by the Jewish Federations of North America. It was about 30 people, um, some professionals and some lay leaders from about a dozen mid-sized cities around North America. And it was a really, they called it a fly-in, a 36 hour fly-in. It was super fast. We got to Warsaw on Monday afternoon, 
did some um, site visits to places that the Jewish Agency and the Ju Joint Distribution Committee were ho hosting refugees and processing people for Aliyah there in Warsaw. Met that night with the chief rabbi of Poland, the head of Hillel in Poland, who are married, by the way, um, and some other people. And then the next, the next morning, we got up at like five in the morning and headed first to Lublin, uh, to another refugee shelter that was in this very interesting and odd place, a yeshiva that has been turned into a hotel that's now a refugee center. That's where we met and talked with a number of refugees. And then we headed to the border at Medica, the largest of the, I think, nine crossings in Poland. And then we went back to Warsaw and the mission was, we had a debrief that night and then people, it was basically over. I spent another half day um, in Warsaw uh, looking around and talking to people. So that's my, that was my itinerary. I, and I, I'll tell you a few takeaways and then Rachel, if you want to ask me another question, I'll try to get more focused. I mean, the first thing is that uh, the moments we were there was not an intense cr crisis. I mean, it was a time when the people coming over the border, it was very slow, but also nothing we saw was kind of crowded or overrun. So that made us all feel better about, we were not taking resources away from an urgent um, need. But for me, having spent a bunch of time reporting on Syrian refugees in Jordan and in the Zatari refugee camp, it was very striking how different um, this refugee crisis is and has been. Um, it is uh, A, largely middle-class people coming out, B, they are coming out to a very welcoming and well-organized Europe um, with, you know, now basically no restrictions on where they can go. People can get work, can get, um, can get education for their kids, et cetera. And, um, and it is both highly organized by the humanitarian side and very, very dispersed. Many of the refugees in Poland have gone to stay at individual people's homes and spread out throughout Poland and throughout Europe to do that. Um, there were a million and a half Ukrainians in Poland before the war. So many of the refugees who came over to Poland had a relative, a friend, an acquaintance, an old colleague that they could go connect with even just through that network. And then, then beyond that, there's also, we wrote a story about um, two Harvard kids who set up a website for people to match to host, offer to host and to, to be a refugee to get housing. And there are 70,000 listings on that website already. So, um, so this is, so it was not a very visible crisis. The refugees we met were not kind of in desperate, you know, they weren't in squalor, they weren't hungry, they weren't waiting in lines anymore. People were fed and in very nice uh, established settings. The, the, the psychic trauma of losing your home is, is the same as you see in any refugee crisis and obviously of your country being at war, but the kind of basic level of humanitarian situation is, is much better than other situations that we've seen. Um, so that was a big takeaway. The other big takeaway is that there is a massive Israeli and Jewish presence as part of all the refugee humanitarian efforts. There's highly organized, big organizations funded by the American Jewish community, like the like Jewish Agency and JDC. There's also a big Hatzola, you know, emergency aid presence from Israel. And then there are also like random volunteers from Israel all over the place. Um, one of the guys I was with spent the day after we were together hanging out with these Israeli medical clowns. Um, I met these two completely random people from a Moshav who just had gone to the border for the week. Um, there was a, there's a lot of Israel and Jewish stuff happening. And I think the third big takeaway I would say is just that some of you know and have been deeply engaged in the Jewish renewal efforts in the former Soviet Union really for 30 years, but I think very intensively for the last decade or so. Um, very much those, those same organizations, Jewish Agency, JDC, and also Chabad have been like very active throughout Ukraine. And that has been one of the ways that, I mean, that's one of the ways that it feels most tragic for the Jewish community is the idea of like, what will happen to all of that. Um, but one of the reasons that the Jewish community has been able to organize so well to support refugees coming out is because of all that groundwork that's been laid. I think that the JDC was in like 80 different cities and they had a database of like 37,000 names of Jews that they had worked with and helped and they had contact information for them. Um, Israel had some huge number of shlichim of, of um, what's a shlichim again? Messenger? What is it? 
What is it? I forget the English word for that. Anyway, who were placed in Ukraine. Nectar, ambassador, I'm not sure. Ambassador, sure. To, so those people were all, you know, someone at an orphanage, someone at a day school, someone. So there was a lot of networks that were established that were able to be leveraged um, for this uh, for this refugee um, relief effort. And that's one of the reasons that, that Jews have actually been really um, well set in this crisis. And it's one of the ironies, which Larry just wrote about last week, um, is that after many generations in which being Jewish in this part of the world was a burden and a, 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 you know, a, a threat to your, your security and your safety, in this crisis, it has been really a leg up for a lot of people. Which is just wild. Um, and gosh, wait, I can't believe we're already at 7.15. The time is flying. Um, so I guess I'll just, my, I'll, just I'll, I'll ask a wrap up question which or, or a couple one is um did you see these jewish agencies helping people who weren't jewish as well as jews is the first question and the second is what stories are we going to be looking for in the coming weeks and months do you think and then after that we're going to move on to the second piece of our program um the the the, the answer to the first is yes they were i mean and in, in different ways i mean the jewish agency is like primarily about locating people who want to make Aliyah and helping them do that. So there's, but but the, the first brush is very wide, whoever comes to the tent, whoever comes to the shelter. Um, but that is the focus of the Jewish agency. Um, certainly the others I think are, are working quite broadly across the effort. I mean, nobody's sort of turned away or nobody's IDs are checked or anything like that. Um, but people also kind of find their way to the you know, if you want to go to Italy, you sort of find your way to the Italian tent. Um, in terms of, I mean, some of the things that are upcoming, like right now, are thinking about how are people going to incorporate Ukraine into their state, or how are Ukrainians, whether inside Ukraine or outside, going to observe Passover. Um, some of the bigger issues, I think, to watch beyond, I mean, you know, obviously, the results of the war is the thing that we all want to, you know, the prosecution of the war, but that's really not our story. That's what I think we're watching and trying to understand. I think, you know, we want to continue to understand how this is similar and different from World War II. Um, you know, those, the images from Bucha over the weekend, you know, that, that was, if, well, what, you know, what media, what, what, we, we know that the media did not cover the atrocities of the 1930s quickly enough, fully enough, aggressively enough. They also didn't have access to information in the same kind of speed that we do. So what's, so, so we think about our responsibility there and I'm trying to think about those parallels. Um, I think the question of how many, you know, where, what, what Israel will do with both the, the large number of, of Jewish refugees making Aliyah and the non-Jewish refugees who want to move to Israel is an important story. And I think that there's a big, big story looming about what's going to happen to the 600,000 Jews still inside Russia. Um, many of them are trying to get out. They've had huge numbers more of applications for Aliyah, um, as well as for visas to the U.S. So the Jewish community, I think, is going to increasingly be focused again of, you know, one of the things that the head of the JFNA said, I think I put this in my story, was um, if the Iron Curtain falls again, we're not going to wait 50 years to get them out. And he's really focused on what will happen um, to Jews in Putin's Russia mm -hmm. as this war goes on or if this war ends either way that it ends for right them, right right um wonderful thank you thank you for that little taste and rachel and zach thank you for sharing your time with jody we just wanted to give the audience a sense of the reporting that's happening right now from this urgent story um i wanted to highlight for all of our attendees that you are at a an exclusive donor event this event is only for donors um and we are so grateful to you for your support i had to just toss that message in, in the middle because really your support is what makes this possible. Um, and we, we literally could not do it without you and we are extremely grateful. Um, so having said that, um, we will demonstrate it to you with more wonderful content. I'm gonna hand it back to Jody to move the program along. Thank you again. And yeah, I'm gonna transition from guest to host. Very, I should like change my hat or something. Um, first, I'm just gonna give quick introductions to, I mean, I know many of you know well, Rachel Schachter, who has been um, our Forward's editor for, oh my God, how many years, Rachel? Uh, I started in 1998. And you, that's, when you, that's not when you started the Forward, right? That's when you started being in no, charge. That was, my, that was my first year at the forward. Got it. Okay. So that's, um, that's 
that's 24 years, I think, right? Next year, um, I'm celebrating my 25th. Fantastic. And Rachel is the very first woman to hold that position since the forward was founded in 1897. Um, and it is a dynamic and um, uh, amazing part of our report. Um, many of you know Rachel from her amazing Yiddish Word of the Day series, which we launched in the pandemic. It's gotten nearly a million views so far. You, If you don't know that series, you for sure have seen her Yiddish cooking videos where she teaches us how to prepare Ashkenazi delicacies like bialis and cabbage strudel. Um, and Ruchel is also the very proud Bubby of three Yiddish speaking grandchildren. Um, and I have been to her house for Shabbat and seen this in action. These are, this, I met three-year-old Yiddish fluent child, very amazing. And I'm thrilled to also introduce Rabbi Zach Golden, who is, his official title is now, as of last week, Deputy Yiddish Editor. He has been um, working with us for about six months on a part-time basis, and we just uh, promoted him. We're very excited to have him, but he's also our resident rabbi. Um, and Zach's going to tell you a little bit more about his journey before, but I'll just say he's grew up in Canada and Winnipeg and then in Southern California. Um, he now is based in L.A., went to um, college at McAllister after taking up Yiddish as kind of, he went to a public high school, but he decided to learn Yiddish as a senior project. And he sang a Yiddish folk song in front of the whole school, which if we're lucky, we're going to get him to do again tonight. Um, and then after McAllister, Zach went to rabbinical school at Ziegler. He graduated in 2020 and he founded a really uh, creative congregation out there that he may tell us a little bit about. Um, welcome both Zach and Rachel. Um, and I'm really, I am going to start, that was my, that was my Afghan my mom made me. It's a little cold in my basement. Um, I am going to start by asking each of you, this, this conversation is about our history and our present and our future and how they're really connected. And you, of course, are the bridges um, for that. And I just want to ask you to kind of talk personally a little about your own journey um, to Yiddish, through Yiddish, and, and to the forward. We'll start with Rachel and then hand off to Zach, because I think that helps tell the story of how much the forefurts um, has changed and is changing all the time. So start with you, Rachel. Yeah, so I come from a long line of Yiddishists. My father was a Yiddish professor uh, at Columbia, Mort Schechter, and uh, you know, we had to speak Yiddish at home. We had no choice. If we used any English, we had to put a penny into a jar. That jar got filled up pretty fast. Uh, and uh, so I grew up knowing that Yiddish was really an important value and important part of our uh, Jewish identity. Uh, he, my parents sent us to a Yiddish school. We went to public school during the day. And then every afternoon we went to a Yiddish school and we got an excellent education of Jewish history and Bible, um, Hebrew, um, holidays. And uh, fast forward, um, when I was, I loved to write. Uh, I was a songwriter. Uh, four of my songs are actually on an album called Vasagal, which is one of the songs that I wrote. Vasagal means little stream. Uh, and I, um, when I got the offer to come to the Farvets, I was very nervous because as a songwriter and as a short story writer, I was published, many of my short stories were published in Yiddish. I didn't think I would be able to make the transition to journalism. It's a very different kind of writing. Um, and it's not as uh, touchy feely as it is when you're writing fiction. Um, but as soon as I came, I felt like a fish in water, even though I was the only woman there, I was 50 years younger than everybody else there. Uh, there That's was not an exaggeration, right? You were actually- no, <laughs> uh, They were basically 80 year old uh, Bundists and, um, and a couple of middle-aged Hasidim. And um, they, they, every time they spoke to me, they had this frozen smile on their face as if they'd never spoken to a woman before. Um, so it was, uh, it was just something that I learned on the job and, um, and then fast forward to 2016, when I got the job to be editor, I was so excited because it gave me a chance to really spread my wings. Uh, and um, I'd always felt that going digital was the way, was the best way for Yiddish because so many people who love Yiddish don't read it. 
and I wanted to bring them in. And that was especially emphasized during the pandemic when we started Yiddish Word of the Day. We just started it because we knew people were lonely and had, weren't working and were stuck at home. And we thought this was like a nice pick me up. And I was just amazed by the letters that were started coming in right away. Um, you know, some of them were, uh, wow, I haven't heard this word in, in 20 years or even 50 years. And others were saying, why didn't you use this expression? <laughs> but that's OK. Complain. If you complain, I know you're really invested in it. And uh, it, it's been very exciting. And it really made me refocus um, our um, our audience that we should really be writing we have to continue writing in Yiddish because that's the love that I come with and that we have so many dedicated Yiddish readers. But at the same time, we need to focus on video and on English about Yiddish. Um, and one of the things that I would like Zach uh, to bring, uh, he's, I rely on him to find all the, the stats, uh, you know, where we're doing well, where we need some work. And um, so, Zach, why don't you uh, tell them what's well, happening? Let, let's, let's hold off for a second about the stats, just to hear a little bit more about um, Zach's kind of journey through Yiddish into the forward. You know, when I when I first got this, I mean, I, I do not have a Yiddish background. I It's embarrassing how little Yiddish I know. I, I want to admit that right up front. And, you know, the world of Yiddish was really new to me when I came to the, the modern world of Yiddish was really new to me when I came to the forward. And I've been kind of taught by you, Rachel, and others to not talk about the Yiddish Renaissance because you've taught me that this kind of revival, renewal, re-engagement with um, the Mamalashin has been multiple times over over the last several generations. Um, Zach, you may be part of one of the latest waves of this, but we keep writing about, we keep seeing this renewed interest and these new young people coming to it. So tell us a little bit about what made you do that in high school. Um, and then kind of, again, your journey through Yiddish and, and to the forward and, and what, what you, to the forwards, I don't, I worry that I'm going to mistake it and say it wrong. Um, and, and kind of where you are now and where you're, where you think we're headed. Yeah, so I actually, I don't recall having any other motivation aside from it. I've seen a lot of people respond to the Holocaust and the things we've lost by uh, focusing on, on being powerful, like, or like in Israel or like safe in America, but I never saw anything about taking back or taking or, or, or growing what's already ours. And um, I decided for my senior project just on that that really strong impulse uh, to go visit a Holocaust survivor Hazan down the block, and I just I didn't know I didn't know where Yiddish lived at that time. I was just by myself in Long Beach, California, and I just asked him, "Tell me words." So, so I I just asked him as many words as I, as I could, like what the conjugations are, based on my understanding of like how to learn a language from learning French in high school, and um, and then afterwards, I leaned back on my dad raising me on Theodore Bikel uh, songs uh, and his attachment to that. And I picked Kuma Her Du Filozof, which uh, is actually quite a comical song, but I took it very seriously at the time. And I, I introduced the, my whole school to that song as part of my whole project. And I didn't stop hearing afterwards, oh, what's Yiddish? What did you just sing in uh, all over the school? And, people kept asking me all the time what, what was going on and it was really gratifying and it, it said to me like okay there is something beautiful about this and I and I have to keep going with it um, but I was it was hard to get too much encouragement going on um, I, a lot of it was just self-study or real minor uh, college Yiddish I found it somewhere and I just tried to study from it and then I found out about, it turned out, uh, Ruchel's son's um, project Yiddish Farm in the middle of my time in rabbinical school. Um, and I went there and got immersion there. And I didn't know until like a few months before, like a few, like a month before I started this job, that they were related, which uh, took me by shock uh, yeah, that I knew her name. son. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, I was, I was like, huh, I, I guess you do know me. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, from then on, I had 
tried my best to spread Yiddish everywhere I could go when I visited Russia, especially in the Far East to teach Judaism. I was teaching some of the people who uh, were from Birobidjan, the Yiddish, the former or partially Yiddish speaking region of Russia, and, and, uh, and they knew the songs in Yiddish I was singing, but, but they, didn't, they knew them by Russian lyrics. Um, and uh, I am very dedicated to to seeing Yiddish grow, I've noticed it grow with a lot more and more and more people, a lot of my peers, they want to hold on to um, some sort of anchor in history that's theirs. I feel like it's finally getting destigmatized. It was so stigmatized for me my entire time learning it. And this very moment that we're facing right now, at the same time that we're able to finally have an online reach to reach a lot of new people and, and introduce Yiddish as fresh and, and like not part of like something you want to throw behind. I, it's absolutely amazing that I get to be in this position working under, under Rachel to have this uh, dream come true of, of, of really like rekindling. If you told me when I started in high school that I could work for the Forberts, uh, in any capacity, I would think that's as ridiculous of a dream as becoming an astronaut or the president. Uh, so I like, this is just bizarre, and, uh, but I'm going to roll with it until, until they tell me. Okay. Um, Zach, you are breaking up a little bit for me. So if you can just check your internet, um, and, uh, thank you, Aaron, for putting the Yiddish brief sign up in the, um, chat. If you can also put a link to the Yiddish word of the day video series, that would be great. And, um, I also just want to say, we would love to take your questions. The way to do that is to click on that Q and a button. It's on the bottom of your screen. If you're on a laptop, it might be on the left. If you're on a phone, um, Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, obviously the history, we're talking about 125 years of the Fauverts and when it started, it was all the news, all the everything in Yiddish. And now what we do is quite different from that, right? We're really covering um, the Yiddish cultural landscape, right? So Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of how you think about what what to do, you, and you can both talk about how you think about what to do and how you think about who it's for and who we're trying to reach, who we're trying to serve. Well, obviously uh, we want people to know what's happening in the Yiddish world. So part of our new newsletter, uh, Yiddish Brief, is to have events. There's a calendar there that lets people know about mostly online events for anybody, but also now we can bring back in-person events that have to do with Yiddish. Many of them are lectures or concerts that anybody can enjoy because the lectures are in English, but it's about Yiddish. Um, but in addition to that, there's also so much research being done about Yiddish literature, about the history of the Jews in Eastern Europe, now about Ukraine. People are just gobbling it up. And so we take advantage of that uh, fondness, that connection that people have now to Eastern Europe. And so uh, twice a week, we publish, I don't know if the word verb is published, but we send out uh, the Yiddish Brief newsletter. And I always start it with a personal touch because I think it's important for people to see who I am. I mean, they know me as a Yiddish teacher, but I also have other sides. And, um, and I want people to see that Yiddish is, has a really broad landscape. You have the Yiddish speaking Hasidim, you have Yiddish speaking socialists, you have millennials who are um, you know, searching for something that is not Israel-centered or religion-centered, and they find some, you know, something really beautiful about Yiddish as, you know, as a minority language. And so each newsletter that we uh, put out, I stress another aspect of Yiddish. And um, it's really working out well because um, it, you know, the, the numbers keep going up. And it's also a way for people to be engaged in the Fauvets if they don't go to our website or if they don't use Facebook. I love Facebook. I find it to be a very easy way to share with many different groups. I belong to all sorts of groups, you know, children of Holocaust survivors, second generation, learn Yiddish, learn Yiddish. In other words, we have for, for so many different interest groups. And so when I... Uh, when we have an article that I think is accessible to people who love Yiddish but may not know it very well, 
I post it in, if it's a, a food, you know, if it's a cooking show, there are so many Jewish food uh, uh, pages. If it's music, there's Klezmer, there's Klez Canada, there's Klezmer with an exclamation point. Uh, there's Jewish music and uh, Yiddish music. So um, I think really it's interesting that the pandemic was, um, it was obviously a very traumatic experience for many of us, but it was also a way for Yiddishists to connect throughout the world. I remember there was a time when the Workman's Circle was happy that they had 50 students a year. They now have over a thousand students a year. It's unbelievable. And I have taken Workman's Circle courses because they're so interesting. They now have the resources to be able to hire real quality teachers, not just for beginners, but for people like me, reading poetry in Yiddish in the original, uh, a short story by Chaim Grade, who was uh, you know, one of the greatest writers we ever had from Vilna. Uh, and really, um, I wish I had more time, but you know, I have a full-time job, but for other people who don't, uh, they are taking these courses right and left. And those are also future readers and viewers of the Fawvets. So I think that it's great that we can have this all work together. Um, Jerry, I see your question. And um, we actually were just talking about this earlier today at another meeting. Um, there will be some new, we have been recycling some Yiddish word of the day videos. It's true. I think there are over a hundred videos though, right? Um, but we, we do kind of repeat them because um, Rachel has a lot of things to do. And we also just want to, you want to maximize, make sure that um, everybody gets to see them all, right? Um, but we were just talking today about now that Zach is on board full time, we will hopefully be able to produce some fresh ones. And Rachel was welcoming suggestions for um, themes, topics. for topics, <laughs> for, for subjects that she should address in her Yiddish for today. So feel free, Jerry and others, to put those in the chat. Um, or to respond to the, there's an email always in the Yiddish brief every twice a week when that goes out. Um, Zach, I wonder if you could talk a little bit of how you think about, you know, what the forwards, how, who the forwards is for and how we should reach them. And maybe you can segue that into talking about some of the growth that we've seen um, in the last six months or so. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like the theme of what are the trends we're, we're seeing now. I can sort of pinpointed into three things that are going on. And I can relate that with social media or other efforts. First one is convergence. So there are a lot of disparate groups that have been engaged in Yiddish that Riffle named like the old, the Bundes, the socialists, um, the millennials and Gen Z um, who are like, I would call them uh, liberal traditionalists. Um, there's the Hasidim. Uh, but I've noticed that there's been a convergence in, in these groups, uh, that they don't stay within their own boundaries as tightly as they used to. And I think COVID is a big reason for it. The biggest place where I've seen boundary breaking is TikTok, because that's an app where you scroll through and you see a video from a completely different culture. Um, and that's the reason why Yiddish TikTok is a genre is picking up. There are many creators who uh, just constantly make things as they explore Yiddish, but there are other people who have Yiddish as their native language that are on there from the Hasidic communities, and they they talk to each other. Like the creators of these things talk to each other. Uh, we have relationships with people in all of these communities that I sometimes write about, sometimes Ruffel writes about. Uh, we 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 work on on having these communities have a conversation and that. And, and TikTok is a facilitator of that, which is why we want to double down on it. It's, it's, it brings Yiddish out in a world that's, that's hungering for cultural interest and diversity as our world becomes actually more flat and the same culturally due to our interdependent technology. Um, but it also is, is bringing our, our potential audiences together. And that's really exciting because it means we don't have to segment content as much. Uh, I've noticed in the Hasidic communities, for example, uh, they're breaking boundaries all the time. They're learning about politics, culture. They're, they're coming up with uh, ways to mix secular things. I mean, for work, I listen to a, a Hasidic trance mashup to like get me through the day. I mean, this is, this is just wild stuff. Okay, so- Zach, I'm uh, gonna pause you for one second yeah. there to just say, 
Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting everybody on the spot here, but um, because this is such a coveted audience of our supporters and this is an inclusive event, if any of you who are in the audience would like to be featured on our TikTok, I want you to get in touch with Rachel or Zach. Zach will put his email on the thing too. We would love to do some TikTok videos with our supporters and and um, and subscribers and et cetera. So uh, get in touch with us if you would like to be featured on our TikTok. Okay, now the three camps. So we had convergence. What's convergence. the second theme? The second one is breaking breaking down borders. Uh, I see that that Yiddish has a real real news like hard news. Uh, role because for example i posted an article recently written by sheva Tsuker on on um on a group that's largely uh inhabited by people in russia and ukraine about the tragedy in russia and ukraine and in yiddish whoever was writing in russia was comfortable writing in yiddish about their distaste and disgust for the war and yiddish has has still a role uh in, in my opinion as a means of expressing dissent and like an inner sort of understanding in difficult places there's always going to be a role for yiddish as long as there's trouble in the world on that basis alone so i think there's a mission in having the yiddish forwards continue not just uh, not just to spread the culture uh, and the language but also to facilitate the ability for people uh, to express their opinions honestly in difficult situations. And, and Rachel was telling us a couple of weeks ago, um, and maybe you have an update on this, but there was a, a, a new website started, right? Um, about news about the Ukrainian war. And it was in multiple languages. I think you said 20 languages and the Yiddish seemed to have the biggest reach. They had, they had hired a bunch of people or brought on a bunch of people to translate some basic news reports into all these languages. And it was the, um, it was the Yiddish guy who was the busiest, right? Yeah, amazing. And, and the reason I know about it was because he he keeps sending me reports to uh, to post on our site. It's a little bit hard because I need to correct, do a lot of editing. Um, but he also tells me I I don't have the time to do this. Do you know anybody else who could trans the Yiddish translations? When I try to to quit, they say no. We need the Yiddish. Uh, I do find that fascinating. That you really need to profile this guy, Rochel. I want you to remind me tomorrow to get this assigned. Yes. Um, sorry, back to you, Zach, for item number three. We have convergence. We have the descent. Yeah, and I would say the third is is a cultural a cultural construction. Um, you know, Yiddish Yiddish land is in our imagination and in our Zoom screens and sometimes uh, certain places, um, but. To have a drive to uh, keep a language and a, and a culture going, you need to have an actual culture that's that's there. And the truth is, is that in in the Yiddish brief, we we not only talk about our articles, other articles, events that are happening around the world, but it's almost as though uh, we can actually have like a parallel country of Yiddish and Yiddish interests, and that keeps and that keeps people invested because. It, we the beautiful thing about Yiddish recently that's been very exciting is the release of new beautiful new textbooks from the Yiddish Book Center, Yiddish Duolingo, um, uh, translation of Harry Potter into Yiddish. Language is is going to be the basis for uh, you know for for being able to participate in the culture. But you have to have a culture, and you have to have it in a unified place. And the Forgerts has an incredibly important role to keep the language alive by keeping the culture. Uh, in one place contained and easy to find. And I don't think you can get better than, than Yiddish brief, if you ask me. And that, and that explains our growth, growth in it. It's, uh, right, we, so give us some updates about what, what we've seen just in the last six months or a year in terms of growth. And I know we, just so everyone knows, we, we, up until last year, we had two different newsletters that Rachel was in charge of. One that was um, daily in Yiddish and the other was bi-weekly, weekly. Yiddish and English, those translations. We decided that we really needed to bring these two things together and have a, a, a dual language, a bilingual newsletter that, and, and Ruffle already described a little bit about how it is, and most of you probably get it. Um, but what, what's been kind of interesting is we took those two newsletter lists, put them together, and we've seen really significant growth just since January, right, Zach? Yeah, that's right. So starting in January, uh, we had about four thousand five hundred people uh, subscribed and that's grown to about five thousand four hundred now which is a, 
really significant increase. And we maintain a very high open rate. It went down actually a, a little bit and then it just rocketed right back up. I mean, we we're almost at 50% open rate. Um, it's, it's a really positive sign that people are engaged. People are, are reading uh, what Ruffle writes and following into the stories that she's referencing and um, people are interested in what goes on. And we put the, and we put the Yiddish uh, at the, at the, in the email and people gravitate towards the Yiddish if they're inclined and they read it. And uh, it's, it's really, it's really a, a pleasure to see that, um, that, that this is, is a, a real cultural container of, of Yiddish life, Yiddish kite and so on. Rachel, um, I want to ask you about, you know, I love, you know, you've been engaged, you've worked at the performance for longer than, than any of us. And I think you were connected to it long before that. So I wonder what, um, what would be most surprising to the young Rachel, the Yiddish student, the Yiddish lover, and the person who walked into that building in 1998 about the Fovritz today and about Yiddish land today? Now, I had no idea. I mean, I remember what it was like in the 1970s and the 1980s when, um, and I was a Barnard student, and there was, there was just no interest. People were taking Yiddish courses, but there was no movement. There was really, people were trying to assimilate in every way. People weren't interested in being religious either. I mean, there was just this move away from being too Jewish. And I think it, everything changed with roots. When the program roots about the, uh, the history of the African-American slaves came out, it was, I think it was a mini series of about four days and it really changed the way we thought of ourselves, not just for black Americans, but for Italian Americans and Polish Americans and Jewish Americans. And suddenly we started saying, hey, what about us? What are we chopped liver? And we and a lot. That's when people started coming back to um, to learn about their heritage, about their Yiddish speaking grandparents. One of the major changes I found, which I also didn't expect, is how many children of Holocaust survivors are so excited about Yiddish. These are people who became their parents were not pushing them into Yiddish. The parents spoke Yiddish. The Holocaust survivors spoke Yiddish to each other. They spoke English to their kids, or they spoke. Yiddish, but they didn't expect the kids to answer and they didn't encourage the kids to learn Yiddish. It was a source of embarrassment. It was meant that you were uneducated, you were an immigrant and the kids believed that. So they became doctors and lawyers and, and uh, financial consultants. And it wasn't until, this is what I'm seeing now, it wasn't until their parents have passed away. And now suddenly they, they get very nostalgic about what they had could have learned from their parents. And so I would never have guessed if you're saying when I was a young woman that um, that I was addressing more than just a bunch of uh, Yiddish readers that so many other people who were assimilating were now coming back. And, um, and many of them expressed regret, not only that they did not want to learn Yiddish from their parents, but that they did not teach their own kids Yiddish or send them to Yiddish schools or, or help create Yiddish schools or even with their grandparents. I mean, part of my job now is encouraging grandparents. You know, it doesn't matter how you do it, even if it's just singing a Yiddish song to your grandson when you're putting him to bed, or you just, you could play, you know, um, uh, finger games with them. There's a very uh, well-known um, Yiddish song that's it's like a patty cake, which goes, Pachi, pachi, kichelach, tati, kleiten, shichelach, and you pinch his cheeks. So what it means is, patty cake, patty cake. Oh, daddy's going to buy you shoes. Mother's going to uh, knit you some socks. And here I'm giving you a pinch in your cheeks. Kids love it. And it's easy to learn. Um, and I so think that, that needs to be on TikTok tomorrow, Zach. We can oh, just pull yes. it right off we, of... did, we did have it in Yiddish word of the day. Uh, I think it was the theme was children's games. Uh, but I agree. You know, Rachel, when you what you said about Holocaust survivors really hits with me because one of the most memorable for me stories that I wrote when I was in Jerusalem was about this trend that I had not known anything about, which actually is of the children and grandchildren of Auschwitz survivors getting their their parents and grandparents' numbers tattooed as like new tattoos, fresh tattoos. 
Um, and I think it's like kind of a similar phenomenon. The, the parent, the, the, obviously the Auschwitz survivors, many of them were very ashamed of the tattoo and hated it, tried to get it off. And now we would, I saw these young people, again, grandchildren, um, going to, to take this number as a, the, the survival as this point of pride. So it's really interesting parallel. Um, Zach, what, so I know one of the things you have done in your time here is you spent some time in the archives, you love the history too. What, what has surprised you most that you've learned about the Fauverts having come from that modern Yiddish land that Ruchel's describing? Um, I think that I always looked up to the Forverts, it, it really in a kind of an intense way. Um, but I didn't know, I didn't know what made it, what it was. And the more I learned that it was the bedrock of Jewish life, it had everything. What, you know, I, I found out from uh, uh, a friend of mine that um, there are these uh, translations of the of the Tanakh in Yiddish by Yehoash that were that used to the forfeits used to give out as a uh, like a yearly subscription gift, and this was the same institution that published very secular authors. They they published books on on world literature to teach you how to uh, how to like become more worldly in, all in Yiddish, and you could this is this is the most inspirational example of containing a whole cultural life for people who are learning to be American, but also learning more deeply how to be a literate uh, human being, um, understanding who they are and just the sheer size of it from the radio station uh, to these books that were given out to the literature that was published um, to the, the advertisements are very interesting. Sometimes I see them. Um, it's, it's, it gives, it gives you an idea of, of just how full a Jewish life was and can be supported by one institution that really was dedicated and still is dedicated to being a safe space. You know, it's funny, my mom was looking at the forward, uh, the, the modern day forward for the first time. And she's like, well, it's like the news, but I, I don't feel like nervous or upset about it. It's just like normal from like my Jewish perspective. And th that's because this is the, the home for Jewish people. I mean, to me, I think Yiddish and the forward and the forwards is a healing institution because it, com because it comes from our perspective. And Yiddish comes from our past. And, and that I want Yiddish and, and I want the forward, forward and the forward to serve that same purpose of being something that heals people by saying, this is my voice, this is my culture. I don't have to be excluded from society in this way. This is my society. I love that. Um, Rachel, I know that um, we published a video a couple of years ago in which Daniel Kahn, the great klezmer musician, what did a Yiddish rendition of Hallelujah that got something like 2 million views on YouTube. What are some of, what, is our, what are the other greatest hits of the modern forwards? What are the things that have gotten the most views on our site or on, on YouTube? Well, Daniel Kahn is always a winner. I mean, he, he also did um, several songs, a Dylan song and a, a Woody Guthrie song. But I actually also like those films that don't necessarily do well, but I think they, they serve a symbolic purpose. One of them was for the 20th um, Yorkshire of 9-11. Um, I, I contacted two singers uh, what, to sing songs, Yiddish songs that were written uh, as a reaction to 9-11. One of those singers was, uh, and songwriters was Josh Waletsky, a filmmaker who uh, created um, many wonderful uh, documentaries, Image Before My Eyes, The Partisans of Vilna. He had written a very moving song about 9-11 and he sang it a cappella, very simply without any instrumentation. It was very moving. And I, we did a background article about him as well. And the other one was my aunt, Bela Shech de Gottesman, who was a, uh, a wonderful poet and songwriter. And she wrote a very different kind of song about 9-11. And she's not alive anymore. So we asked um, uh, one of her biggest fans, a, a, a Dutch singer, uh, to perform it for us. And uh, that film is also so um, 
so touching uh, and well done. One of the things that I like doing is encouraging musicians um, who are interested in recording Yiddish music to do it through us. Um, this is one way that we can let people know that culture is being renewed and new songs are being written. Uh, sometimes it's poetry that's, you know, poets that had written the poems years ago, but now being put to music. That's part of Yiddish culture as well, because it's bringing those poems to an audience that never would have read them. And the wonderful thing about doing it in film is you have subtitles. So people can actually listen to the Yiddish song in Yiddish, but follow along with the meaning uh, below. And so they're getting, they're getting it from both sides. So um, Zach has agreed to sing a little bit of his high school folk song. Um, I know Rachel also wants to close us out, but can we give him a couple seconds, Rachel? To, okay, because because we talk about encouraging musicians. Here we are encouraging musicians in real time. So Zach's going to give us a couple bars of the folk song and then Rachel's going to take us out. So thank you so much for being with us. And thank you, Rachel and Zach. Umahe, du Philosoph, mit dein Kätzchen Meuchel. Und umahe, zum Rebenstich, und lass dich doch aussechel. Jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, 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 jam, bam, 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 jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, 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 bam. Adam Schiffos, du hast geklärt. Und er mit sich hyper, der Rebbe spricht sein Titel aus und spannt im Jammer hyper. Jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, 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 jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, bam, jam, bam, 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 bam. That's beautiful. Wow. Oh my um, God, I just imagine it like. 17 year old Zach and his public school. He has such an amazing voice and wow. so presence and boys. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us. And Rachel. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm almost speechless, except those of you who know me know I'm never speechless. But that is what a wonderful note to end on because, Zach, you said a few really beautiful things. You talked about a language itself as a home. You know, the language itself as the home when, you know, we're a wandering people. Um, if I could spotlight myself, by the way, is <laughs> we need we need one switch over so that I'm not a teeny little potion stamp in the top. There we go. Um, so, Zach, thank you. Um, the language is a home. The forward is a healing institution. I mean, these are the beautiful, beautiful sort of. I don't know, the, the ineffable sentiments that drive us to have this connection to the forward and um, and really to make us so grateful to you, our donors, who help keep Yiddish alive. I mean, this is this is why you do it. This is why we do it. And um, we're so grateful to you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Rachel, you absolute star of Yiddish. Thank you, Jody. Um, absolute star of English. Um, thank you, attendees. Thank you, supporters. Please keep an eye out for all of the great stuff we have coming up to celebrate our 125th anniversary that captures so much of what we've discussed here. Um, we will be sending out copious links and emails. Um, please open them and read them. There's great stuff in there. Um, and again, just my thanks, all of our thanks to you for joining us tonight, for being with us on this journey, for making the Yiddish language a home for the Jewish people, um, and um, an early Zeus and Pesach to you. And I think that's it.